All right, if you have a Bible, we'll be in uh, Deuteronomy chapter 6 and Acts chapter 4 today. Also, I want to invite you to grab this uh, booklet. Uh, you should have one. Uh, it should be around you. If you don't find it, uh, just sit up. You're probably sitting on it, so go ahead and grab it. I need you to put it into your hands uh, because... Uh, Everything that you're going to need to know really for the next five weeks is going to be found uh, in this booklet. I I just want to let you know how important uh, this is going to be for us uh, over the next few weeks. Uh, What we're about to do uh, in this five-week teaching series is kick off a two-year discipleship journey called One More that will challenge each and every one of us and change the landscape of our church for years to come. And and so if you uh, have your booklet, if you go to the beginning of it, you can just kind of open it up and uh, you're going to see kind of a, you know, just a a table of contents uh, there. And then um, and then there's a in case you don't remember everything I say, there's a letter from me. Uh, I mean, uh, you can read that whenever you want later, whatever. Uh, If you turn the page, though, uh, you're going to start to see kind of the one more initiative and all the details that we talked about uh, in the video. And I I just want to point out that we have uh, two primary goals in this one more initiative. And the primary goal, and this is very, very, very important, uh, is that every uh, one of us who, who would call Relentless Church home, who's a part of this movement, would take a significant deepening faith step towards Jesus over the next two years, uh, beginning these first five weeks. And, and, and as a church, as we look at God's heart, as we wrestle with God's heart, we're going to be asking this fundamental question. What is the one thing in my life that drives everything in my life? What is the one thing in my life that drives everything in my life? So the number one goal is that every one of us, that you would wrestle with what God is doing in your life. Is he the one thing that that is fueling everything in your life? And then our secondary goal is to accomplish everything that we believe God is calling us to over the next two years is that we are believing in faith that we will become self-sufficient. And what that simply means is that we are no longer a ministry of others, but we are a ministry for others, right? I don't know if you know this or not, but uh, there are about 20 churches um, from coast to coast from around the country, uh, big churches and small uh, rural churches that still have the white steeple, right? Um, from coast to coast that have helped us get started. And and now it's our turn. It's our turn. So we are believing in God over the next two years for $350,000 in resources. And now over the long term, that means a lot of things. But to kind of get us there is is if you kind of turn the page and open your book, it's going to be what we're calling the One More Initiative. And and there are three major gospel-centered initiatives. Number one is that we would share God's heart to reach one more, that's evangelism. Uh, Number two is that we want to see one more church established in our city that's focused on multiplying and sending out others locally and globally, that's self-sufficiency. And then number three is what we are calling one more generation, that over the next two years, uh, we will take uh, significant steps as a church to prioritize and resource family ministries and disciple families and kids of all ages. And then, uh, if you turn, uh, turn the page again, uh, you should have this in, in there as well. You should have a card uh, in there as well. Go ahead and pull that out. Uh, this is called a commitment card. Uh, now, be careful, uh, because you're, you're really not ready for this yet. You, you've got to have like five weeks of training uh, to prepare you to get to this point. But I want you to take this commitment card, and I want you to put it into, you know, put it into place uh, right now where you can start praying Uh, about what God might be calling you to do as an individual or as a family over the next two years. That that if we could really see God as He is, that we would respond by loving Him with all. And this is a part of loving Him with all. And what what I need you to do is, is not do what I tell you to do. What I need you to do is I need you to start leaning in and praying and asking God, what is He calling you to do? What is the Holy Spirit calling you to do. And in about four weeks from now, we're going to gather up as a faith family and we are going to make a faith commitment together. And let me just say this. Uh, If you're not in a group yet, please, 
please, please, please get in a group because we're going to be diving into this study together uh, as a church. So after the, after the service today, you can go to the info table and you can sign up for a group, even if it's just for the next five weeks, right? Please, please, please get into a group. All right, now we're ready to jump in. So Deuteronomy, right? Deuteronomy chapter six is where we're going to be uh, to kind of get started here. Uh, the word Deuteronomy uh, simply means the second law. Uh, not that there are two laws, right? But Moses is repeating the first law. The first law is found in Exodus chapter 20. This is the Ten Commandments. Uh, and then when you get to Deuteronomy chapter 6, like Moses knows that like his, his time of a leadership is, is coming up. He is about to pass on. But before he goes, he repeats the law. He says, uh, basically, before you go into the promised land, he's like, pay attention here. Like, look at me, pay attention here. Don't miss this. Don't you forget this. That's Deuteronomy. And in chapter, chapter 6, what we find is probably the most prayed prayer of all time. It's called the Shema. Why is it called the Shema? Because that is the first word in it, is Shema. If you look at verse 4, uh, it says, Shema, O Israel. It gets translated as, Hear, O Israel. Now, uh, a lot of times, uh, you know this, our English words don't fully get the picture of what's going on. So this is not just, hey, uh, listen. The word Shema doesn't just mean like, hear this or hear, uh, hear words. Hear, do you understand the words that are coming out of my mouth, right? Like that is not what Shema, Shema is more like when my, my daddy would look at me and say, boy, listen to me, right? Anybody know what I'm talking about? You ever had that You went with your dad or mom or maybe a coach, right? Just, boy, it means to, I'm, I'm to listen, and I'm to obey. It's like, um, it's like hear and heed. He's sort of saying uh, that if you could get a picture of, of what I'm about to lay out to you, if you could get a picture of the glory of God, if you could just wrap your mind around God and all of his glory, then it would change everything about, about everything, about your life. So he says, Shema, O Israel. And then he says, the Lord our God is one. And the Hebrew word here is the word ehad. Okay, I want you to try to say it with me. Say ehad. Say it with me. Yeah, right? If, if you're doing it right, your neighbor should know. Like it should get on them just a little bit. Like it's just deep, kind of just guttural language, just ahad. And so when he says the word uh, ahad, it, it doesn't just mean like uh, the, the number one. So like when we think of the number one, we tend to think in like numerical value. Like if I'm going to make a list, I'm going to start with the number one. One, but here when he's talking about the word ehad, it's not it's not that God is number one on my list. It's like um, how do I say it? It's like God is the page. It's the whole page in which I write my list on. That that everything in my life would be all about Him. My my faith, my my family, my finances. Everything in my life would be about Him. And and, and when we see Him as He is. When we see him in all of his glory, here is our response. He says, verse 5, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And these words I command you today shall be on your heart. The reality is that God has given us one life, one and only life. And when we, when we see him as he is, we should respond. We owe him our one and only life. Life, But the problem is, and you know this, that as Americans, we often live some compartmentalized lives, don't we? Like we tend to think that like I have a work life over here, right? And then I have kind of my, my family life over here. And I've got, a, I've got a hobby life over here. And then I've got kind of an online life over here. But the problem is we, we don't have different lives. We have, we have one life. That's it. We only have one life. And in fact, the, the word integrity uh, it comes from the word integer, which simply means one, just one. And so over the next two years, we're, we're going to be wrestling with the Shema. Hear, O relentless church, the Lord our God is one. And, and so we're going to be asking these questions over and over and over. Is God the one thing in my life that drives everything in my life? And if you, if you would say yes, then... Here's the question. What would it look like to love God with everything? What would it look like to love God with everything? So what I want to do today is I want to take you 
to Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4. This is, we're going to kind of kick off here in Acts chapter 4, because in Acts chapter 4, we're going to get a, a historical account of these two men who got a glimpse of the glory of God, and it changed everything about all of their life. And they began to love God with all. They began to love God with a kind of a, a reckless abandonment, no matter, regardless of what it cost them. So you have a Bible. Acts chapter 4, we'll pick it up in verse 1. It says this. It says, And as they, the they there is Peter and John, were speaking to the people. So Peter is preaching again. Go figure. The priest and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, greatly annoyed, underline that, greatly annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. Now, there are two reasons why they were greatly annoyed, okay? First of all, the Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, right? Maybe you've heard this. That's why they were sad, you see. Like, I, I know it's dumb, but you'll remember that for the rest of your life, right? You will. You're welcome. Uh, but here's the reason why they were greatly annoyed. Because every time the gospel is preached, lives are changed. Lives are changed. And religious people get annoyed. Why? Because life change is costly. Life change is messy. And, and God rarely ever does it in a way that kind of fits into a particular religious box that, that you and I have created that religious people have created. You see, religious people love things to be like nice and tidy and clean and efficient. And can I just say something? God is really not any of those. Like he, what does he do with his love? He lavishes his love out. You know what that means? It means to dump out, to pour out. And when you lavish something, man, it just goes everywhere, right? It's not nice and tidy and clean and efficient. It's not like a drop of love. You ever seen those like, like pill, like little droppers for dogs, like medicine? Like he's, God's not just a little bit of love, just a, just, just, a, just a little. That's not our God. Like he lavishes his love. He dumps it out. And when that happens, I mean, man, religious people, man, they, they get annoyed. And, and I'm telling you, man, things like this one more initiative, man, are going to I mean, religious people are just going to get annoyed. What? Like, what do you mean you want to grow? Like, what, what do you mean you want to expand the budget to prioritize families and kids and, um, and, and grow in that way? What do you mean you want to maybe try some different service times to reach? What do you, what do you mean? Like, re religious people get annoyed. And this is what we see in verse 3. Religious people are annoyed. Verse 3, it says, And they arrested them and put them in custody until now, for it was already evening. But many of those who had heard the word believed, and the number of men came to be about 5,000. How many? 5,000, right? Man, the, the, the church, so the church is like blowing up. Why? Here's why. Because the gospel works, right? The gospel works. Verse 5, it says, On the next day, the rulers and elders and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem with Annas the high priest and Caiaphas and John and Alexander and all who were of the high priestly family. And when they had set them in the midst, this is kind of how the Sadducees would put people on trial. They would just kind of throw them in the center and then like circle around them. Um, it's kind of like bull in the ring. And, and then it says, and they inquired. So Peter and John are on the hot seat here. And here's the question. Watch this. By what power or by what name did you do this? So what magical power do you have or whose power are you borrowing? So that's what they ask. Verse 8. And then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, uh-oh, here we go, said to them, rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed? Now, hold on, just stop there because uh, what he's a talk, what he's talking about here is uh, events that happened back in chapter three. Uh, see, he knew what he was talking about, and they knew what he was talking about. But you might not know what he's talking about. So, if you've got a Bible, go with me back to Acts chapter three uh, because I want you to see the context of, of what he's talking about. It's actually really, really good. Uh, go to chapter three, verse one. It says this, Now Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. 
And a man, lame from birth, was being carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple that is called the Beautiful Gate, to ask for alms of those who were entering the temple. Seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked to receive alms. So apparently this was, this was a great time to ask for money. People are going into the church, and I don't know, maybe God will like me better if I give before I go in. And so he's there. He's in front of the temple, and this is what happens next. It says, And Peter directed his gaze at him, as did John, and he said, Look at us. Look at us. Like Again, like when your coach says, Hey, look at me. Listen. Pay attention. Look at eyes. Give me your eyes. Let me see your eyes. Give me your eyes. Um, my, my oldest son, um, Asher, just started playing like football uh, for the first time, and um, Man, like, it, coaching eight to nine-year-old boys is like hurting cats, okay? It just is. Like, I've, ne- like, I've never, teachers, I got some teachers in the front row. They're like, yes, yes, we, we understand. Um, but, like, my, the coach, like, says this all the time. Hey, look at me. Boys, l- listen. Like, this is what's going on. When, what he's saying is, hey, what I'm about to say is really important. Now, if you're the poor man asking for alms, you've got to be thinking, this is about to go good for me. Like, this, this is about to go real good for me. And so he fixes his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I have no silver and gold, but what I do have, I give to you. Now, hold on. What do you think the crippled man is thinking now? Like, like oh, man, like, really? Like, what do you got for me? Advice? <laughs> I don't need your advice, bro. I need I need your money. <laughs> like, I need, I need some money. I need you to give me some money. Now, how many of you know that oftentimes the things that we are asking for are not the things that we need? Anybody? All right. How many of you know that it's oftentimes God's grace to answer that prayer request with a no way? You see, our, our problem is not that we... Our problem is not that we dream too big. I think our problem is that we settle for so little. Like, man, this, this man wants help, and God has healing for him, right? You, you know, some of you are begging for God for a boyfriend, and what you need is intimacy. Some of you are, are begging God for a little, little bit more cash and prizes, and what you need is contentment. And so Peter, Peter says, I, I have no silver or gold, but what I have to you, I give to you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Rise up and walk. See, that's what this brother needed. This brother needed a, a healing. Now notice, now notice what Peter doesn't do. Okay, no, notice the, fa- the faith, the bold faith. Peter sees this man in need. The Spirit of God nudges Peter and out loud, out of his lips, out of his mouth, out of his conviction, out of his heart, right? He says, rise up and walk. Now, do do you have that kind of bold faith to to pray those kind of bold prayers? Because here's what Peter could have done. Peter Peter could have said, hey, I'll put you on the prayer list. Uh, In fact, I'm going into church right now. What's your name? Fred. Okay, Fred, walking. Okay, cool, going in there. But he doesn't do that, does he? Out loud. Out loud, he says, rise up and walk. And we're going to find out in a minute that the the brother gets up. But do do you pray that kind of bold prayer? Now, this next part blows me away, verse Verse 7. It says, and he took him by the right hand and raised him up, and immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. Now, pop quiz. When was this guy healed? He wasn't healed when he said it. He was healed when he reached out his hand. I mean, this is, this is what the book says. I'm just reading the book. He says, rise up and walk. Ain't nobody walking. But he reaches out his hand and he pulls him up. Can you imagine that? Like, I mean, this is bold faith. Bold faith is simply just behaving as if you actually believe. 
He's reaching down, he's picking this brother up like he can actually walk and he just believes because the Spirit of God says that he can do it. He's going to do a miracle and it happens. Now let me just tell you why this freaks me out. It, It just makes me think if the miracle happened by Peter reaching out his hand, how many miracles are still sitting on the sidewalk because we chose fear over faith? How many? How many do we just walk on by? And for you, it might not be with people walking, but you got a relationship. Man, it's been busted up for a long time, and you know the Spirit of God has nudged you to call her or to call him and to reconcile, to make things right. And you come down here and you have prayed and prayed and prayed. You even kind of outsourced your prayer. You went to someone on the sides and they prayed with you. You prayed and prayed, but you never got out your phone to make that phone call. And the miracle is still sitting on a curb. Or maybe, maybe you got a, maybe you got a one more. You've been praying about like crazy, but you kind of quit because they said no and no again and again. And then they finally said yes. You text them, come to church with me, come to prayer meeting with me, come to group. They said yes, and then they ghosted you. And you just gave up. And the reason the chair next to you is empty is because the miracle is still sitting out on the sidewalk. Listen, let me, let me tell you something. A big part, a big part of this one more initiative is if you lean into God, if you will lean into God, I dare you. James chapter four, verse eight says, if you draw near to God, he will draw near to you. You have no idea what God's going to use you to do. You just lean in how God is going to use you at work. How God is going to use you in your home, in your family, college students in a room, on the campus in the dorm room, in the hallways, in the classrooms. You have no idea how God is going to use you, but I I can promise you this. The Spirit of God is speaking. The question is, are you listening? Are you listening? The Spirit of God is going to speak, and can I tell you something? It's going to feel intimidating. It is. It's going to kind of make you a little bit uncomfortable. It's going to be intimidating. And I would even say this, that if your your prayers don't feel a little bit intimidating, maybe they're insulting to God. Maybe. And then you're going to have a choice. You're going to pray your prayers. You're going to pray big, bold. Then you're going to have a choice. Am I going to reach out my hand in faith? Or am I going to retract in fear? So how many miracles are sitting on the sidewalk because we were afraid? Man, when we boil down all the one more initiative is, it is a movement to get out of our seats and onto the streets to see God do what only God can do. Anybody want to be a part of that? I know that I do. I want to see that. I want to see things and acts happen in my life, in my home, in our church. So this is what Peter does. He reaches out his hand and he is healed. Verse 8. And leaping up. Man, this, isn't it amazing what God can do? Like when I, when I read this, like I imagined this man like shuffling, right? Anybody ever like, like rolled an ankle, broke a foot, broke a bone? It's like it, you kind of have to do the shuffle because like you're trying to retrain yourself how to walk appropriately and like I just imagine this guy like after he's been healed I mean he was crippled essentially from birth like I'm just imagining like this guy needs to spend some time in PT but that's not what it says it says he leapt up leaping up he stood and began to walk and entered the temple with them walking and leaping and praising God And all the people saw him walking and praising God. And they recognized him as the one who sat at the beautiful gate of the temple asking for alms. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what happened to him. Listen, when God does miracles, 
When God changes a life, he is worshipped and people are in awe. Now, back to chapter 4. I give you all of that because Peter says in verse 9, wait, so, so that's what we're talking about? In verse 9, he says, If we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed? Verse 10, he says, Let it be known to all of you, to all the people of Israel. My bad. Somebody says, No. Let it be known to all of you that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified. You want to talk about like, like poking someone like in the eye? <laughs> whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by this man, by him this man is standing well before you. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Mic drop. That's Peter's sermon. Now here's what Peter wants the folks to know. They say, by what name are you doing this? Peter, first and foremost, is saying this is not about us. This is not about the name of Peter. This is not about the name of John. It is only about the name of Jesus. There is one name under heaven whereby we must be saved. Friends, this one initiative is about the one name under heaven whereby we must be saved. That by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you, well, this Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has now become the cornerstone. What Peter is saying here is this. Don't miss Jesus. How do you miss Jesus? I mean, come on, Pharisees. Come on, Sadducees. You had such a good, good head start. Right? You had, God gave you the law, you had all the prophets, you had all the Psalms, you were two feet away from the sovereign Son of God. And you missed him. Why? Because he didn't fit into your religious box. And now he is the cornerstone of everything that God is doing. Friends, don't miss Jesus in this one more initiative. Don't miss Jesus. There is one name under heaven. And his name is Jesus. Now let me tell you what name won't save you. We're not saved in religion's name. Like being a Baptist won't save you. Being a Methodist won't save you. Being a Presbyterian won't save you. That's not how it works. Now make no mistake about it. Religion denominations, tradition, it will make you a better human. You'll be more disciplined in some kind of way. The problem is you're still a dead one. Right? Like you can put a little bit of makeup on a dead person and they're going to look better. You, you can spray a little bit of perfume on a dead person and it's going to be a little bit nicer for a little while. But they're still dead. And that is your condition, our condition, if you think that religion saves you. Let me tell you what else won't save you. Your parents' name won't save you. Your upbringing won't save you. There's a lot, of a lot of people that believe, well, because my grandma was a Methodist, I'm good. No. That's not how it works. There are no grandchildren in the kingdom of God. There's only children. You don't just inherit faith. That's not how it works. Sitting in church doesn't make you a Christian. Like, I don't know, any more than... Sticking your head in an oven makes you a pizza. It's not how it works. It's not outside in, it's inside out. God doesn't save last names, he saves first names. Let me tell you, tell you what else won't save you. Your name won't save you. No matter how much you try to fix you, like a better version of you is not going to save you. It cannot pay the sin debt. Therefore, there is one name under heaven by which we must be saved, and his name is Jesus. 
You see, the command of Moses was to love God with all. All of your heart, all of your soul, all of your mind, all of your strength. The problem is we can't. You know, you know how I know? Because we've tried, haven't we? We've tried, and we can't. So Jesus did it for us. This is what Peter is preaching. There is salvation in no one else except in the name of Jesus. Verse 13. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, now stop right there. If you know Peter and John, that's like saying a lot. I mean, think about it. Now, if you back up in your Bible chronologically in time, six weeks prior to this, uh, six weeks ago, Peter was denying Christ. Three times he denied him. Jesus is on the way to the cross. They're like, hey, are you with him? He's like, Nope. And then a little girl comes up to him and says, hey, Mr. I always imagine, Mr. Peter, Mr. Peter, are you with him? He says, no. And then the third time says he curses and says, no. Like, I don't know. I mean, just can you imagine that? Like, what's your cuss word? Like, don't say it out loud for in church. But, <laughs> but, but no, right? And any time that you read about Peter and John in the Gospels, like, I don't know if you know this, but they're not described as bold or brave or courageous. So what happened in six weeks? It's a pretty good question. What happened in six weeks? In six weeks, they saw the Son of God die, nailed to a cross, buried in a tomb, and three days later, resurrected they saw an empty tomb that's what they saw and in john chapter 20 jesus appears to them and he says to them peace be with you and then he breathes the holy spirit on them that's what they saw friends they got a glimpse of the glory of god the resurrected king so if you can relate with peter like you don't get everything uh, you doubt sometimes maybe you denied him a few times didn't you would make a really good disciple. You would. Verse 13, now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, watch this, and they perceived, they perceived, right, that they were uneducated, common men. They were astonished. And they recognized that they had been with Jesus. Oh, relentless church, may this be said of us. More than anything else, not that we have a great welcome team that's really nice and friendly. Not that we have an amazing kids ministry, which we do. Not that our worship music is awesome. But that we have been with Jesus. That's what this One More Initiative is all about. Just lean in, man. Would you just lean in? And be with him in worship. When we gather together, you're actually with him in worship. Don't just see the church as something to do. Like on a Sunday, be with him in fellowship. Like It's not just an event on a Sunday. It's a family to be a part of through, throughout the rest of the week. Be with him on mission, right? Be with him as we serve the least of these. Be with him in evangelism and inviting your one more, going on mission trips. Just lean in. Now, now watch this, verse 14. But seeing the man who was healed standing beside them, they had nothing to say in opposition. Like, what are you going to do, man? Right? The, the brother couldn't walk. Now he's in the temple doing Jesus jumping jacks, right? Like, how do you, how do you argue with a changed life? You can't. But when they had commanded them to leave the council, they conferred with one another, saying, What shall we do with these men? Oh, I wish that could be asked of me. What shall we do with these men? For that a notable sign has been performed through them is evident to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and we can't deny it. But in order that it may spread no further among the people. Really? Come on. 
let us warn them to speak no more to anyone in this name. So they, they called them and charged them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. Very, very PC of them, right? Yeah, we're cool with the miracle. Just, God, can you keep Jesus out of it? Can, can we do that, guys? But Peter and John answered them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge. For we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. And what they saw and heard is Jesus come out of the grave. They saw the Spirit of God fall. They saw what Moses was talking about back in Deuteronomy. Shema. Pay attention. Shema. Open your eyes. Open your ears. Open your heart. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. He is everything. He is infinite. He is glory. He is the person and work of Jesus Christ. Dead, buried, resurrected, and the Spirit of God lives in us. And when you get a picture of that, man, it changes everything about everything. Verse 21, And when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way to punish them. Because of the people, for all were praising God for what had happened. You see, Peter and John were never the point. Their lives served as a sign to point to one thing, the glory of God. I put it down in my notes like this. When we get a vision of the one true God, we must respond with our one and only life. When we get a vision of the one true God, we must respond with our one and only life. Life. So let me ask you, have you seen and heard Jesus like this in a personal way? Like, have you seen and heard and believed what Jesus has done for you on the cross? That when, when he was on the cross, that, that counted for you. And if you would say, yeah, 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 yeah. Then let me ask you this. If that's true, then what does it look like in your life to love him with all? So here's what I'm asking of you over the next few weeks. A couple things. Number one, I need you to start praying. I mean, pray with intensity. Like, that's different, right? Like, more intensity than you're praying for your burrito on a Tuesday. Pray with intensity. I need you to pray for this church. I need you to start praying, God, would you reveal to me my role in your story? Secondly, I need you to lean in, man. I need you to lean in with me. And, and here's a bunch of ways to do that. I want you to commit to be here for all five weeks. And I want you to be in the Word with us. You can actually scan the QR code that's on your seat, and you can join us in our daily reading plan to discover God's heart. You can join with us in that way. I want you to lean in with us. Right, number three, I've already said this. If you're not in a group, I need you to get in one, at least for the next five weeks. You can... You know, jump in, jump out. I don't care. I don't care if you even like the people, but I need you to be there. I need you to be in a group for the next five weeks. And I need you to start asking this question, what is the one thing in my life that drives everything? Now, if you're a Christian, you know the answer with your lips. But what about your life? What about your life? And then I want you to grab these cards, man. I want you to, to open up your thing. I want you to grab these cards. I want you to start praying. God, if I really got a glimpse of your glory, what might you use me to do? Shema, O Israel. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. And may we love the Lord with all. Father, we are grateful for what you've done for us for how you've sent your son for us, for the sin that you've cleansed from us. Father, we pray now that you would open our hearts and open our minds and open our, our spirits to be sensitive to what you're calling us to do. We give you this time and we give you, more importantly, our lives. In Jesus' name.